and I can see your slides. Oh, wonderful. All right. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so before we get started, Louise is going to put up two poll questions. Um, the first question is, do you manage the rights metadata for your digital collection? Um, and then the second question is, are you familiar with standardized rights statements? Um, and those are such as um, Creative Commons or rightsstatements.org. Um, and we'll give you a couple minutes to, or a couple moments rather, to respond to those. Yep. I launched the first one. So um, do you manage the rights metadata for your digital collections? And I think I'm going to give them five more seconds. Um, all right, so I'm going to share the results. Um, Hannah, let me know if you can see these or not. But um, we had 61% said no, they do not manage the rights metadata, and 39% said yes. Okay. And then, um, and then let me do the other one. I'm launching now. So the second one is, are you familiar with standardized rights statements such as Creative Commons and rightsstatements.org? And while people are voting on that one, Hannah, we had a comment come in who says, I don't know who would manage the metadata for my collection as I'm not really sure what that means, but I'm sure you'll be covering that today, right? <laughs> uh, to some degree, yeah. So just to, for that person, I'm, what I mean by that is um, whoever manages your digital collection. So um, oftentimes this is somebody like a cataloger or a metadata librarian or a digital initiatives uh, person. Um, that's kind of who generally uh, manages the metadata for digital collections. So that's who I'm envisioning. All right. And so I just shared the results of the second question, and the answer was exactly opposite. So 69% are familiar with the standardized, standardized rights statements, and 31% are not. Okay, that's those are that's good to know. So glad to hear that there are people who know. Should go back to your slides now, I think. All right. I might have to click on your slides again because I'm I'm actually still seeing the poll. Um, is anybody seeing my title title screen here? No. Hmm. We'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just real quick change the controls back to me, and then I'm going to um, send it back to you. Sounds good. All right. All right, there we go. Okay. Let's Sorry go ahead. That. That's all right. Thank you, Louise. OK, so well, thanks for everybody for participating in that uh, poll. That was really interesting. Um, I'm glad to hear that there are a, a larger majority of you who are familiar with those um, standardized rights statements to some degree. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, we're going to be covering that today um, in this webinar. Um, and we'll be discussing uh, standardized rights statements in digital collections, how to use them, um, why you may want to use them, and how this fits into the context of the Illinois Digital Heritage Hub, um, also known as the IDHH, and um, also as part of the Digital Public Library of America, also known as DPLA. Um, if you've participated in any of the IDHH workshops before, um, this material will be fairly familiar to you, but I I would recommend that you do stick around um, because familiar, familiarity really is the best defense um, against copyright anxiety. Uh, if you are anxious about copyright, my hope is that after the end of this session, you will feel more confident about describing copyright and applying quality rights statements to your objects in your digital collections. Um, on a similar note, I'd like to add that if you are not an IDHH or a DPLA contributor, this information will still be useful to you and your digital collections. 
So uh, today we will be discussing copyright as it relates to digital collections and rights statements and how users interact with the digital objects based on the information they are given in those rights statements. Um, in a couple of weeks, the University of Illinois copyright librarian Sarah Benson will be giving a more in-depth talk on copyright and we will, and um, sorry, and she will be covering um, copyright in a more general way. Um, if you are if you have questions that are fairly broad in nature regarding copyright, her presentation is going to be a great opportunity to learn more. Um, and then Sarah will be joining me later for the Q&A session as part of this webinar. Um, and we will be answering questions together that you might have. Um, and just a little note here too is that um, Louise asked people initially uh, or before like about a week ago, if you had any copyright questions, we'll be answering some of those questions um, today, but then um, for the questions that were not necessarily about um, right statements or digital collections, Sarah will be answering those in her um, webinar. So, um, yeah, let's begin with copyright. So, um, According to the definition provided by the U.S. Copyright Office, copyright is a form of protection grounded in the U.S. Constitution and granted by law for original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Copyright covers both published and unpublished works. So let's break that down into more digestible bites. So the first requirement is that something must be tangible in order for it to be copyrightable. That means it can be physical or something that can be interacted with in some way. So for instance, a computer program is not necessarily physically tangible, but it can be interacted with. Um, this is in part to distinguish between something eligible for copyright versus something that should be patented. Secondly, a work must be of human authorship. Sometimes this can be a little bit hairy in that it can depend on how much a human is involved or not, and it can be difficult to know if a work fits this criteria. So for instance, David Slater, who is a Welsh photographer, fought over the copyright for photographs that were taken by a crested black macaque in Indonesia with his camera. So you see that guy on the screen there. That's the um, fellow who took a picture. Um, according to US copyright law, the photographs are in the public domain because the macaque was the quote unquote individual who took the photograph and not David Slater, even though Slater was the one who set up the means for the photograph to be taken. Um, similarly, it is still unclear whether images created in Google's deep dream, such as the image on the right hand side, um, belong to the person who inputs the image or the convolutional a uh, neural network program that creates the output. And if it is the latter, then there is no copyright on the item as it was created um, by a non-human entity or the computer. Lastly, it must be original. There must be a minimum amount of creativity to be considered original, which means that copying or digitizing something does not fall within the eligibility of a new copyright designation. Um, it should be also noted that digitization of an object should not be treated as though it were a separate entity from the um, original object. So what does that all mean in regards to what copyright can do? Um, well, copyright is intended to cover the following rights. The right to reproduce a work, the right to distribute the work, the right to create derivative works, and the right to publicly display or perform works. Um, I particularly like this cartoon because it shows a happy little unicorn who is sporting a ever so fashionable uh, horn, but the Narwhal Corporation serves the unicorn a copyright infringement notice, and the unicorn becomes a sad horse because it's no longer able to display that fabulous horn. Um, it's a little tongue in cheek, but I think it's helpful for understanding rights covered by copyright, particularly for uh, publicly displaying or performing a work. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone when you have a chance to take a look at Cornell University Library's copyright term and the public domain chart, which you see here, um, which is managed by Peter Hurdle and it's updated every January um, after the year has turned over. There's a link to the chart in the webinar resources document um, on in your handouts. Um, and I find that this chart is exceptionally helpful in um, determining copyright for items in 
your collections. Um, and the chart is broken up into three sections. Um, first is never published, never registered works, and this covers works that were never published. These items show up a lot um, in cultural heritage collections by way of postcards, diaries, photographs, and similar types of materials. Um, secondly, you also have works registered um, or first published in the U.S. And this covers works that have been published and there are several conditions that apply starting in 1923 going forward. Um, and it is really helpful to familiarize yourself with the many conditions that may apply to the copyright status of a published work. It is also important to consider whether the items that you are intending to put in publicly accessible digital collections are still under copyright and if your institution needs to secure additional permissions to make those available online. Um, thirdly, which is not on your screen, um, but is part of the chart, is works registered outside the U.S. by foreign nationals or U.S. citizens living abroad. This covers works that were published outside of the U.S., both by U.S. citizens living abroad and foreign nationals. Um, and for collections that we harvest in the IDHH, I can't say that I ever come across this um, type of item or items that fall within these conditions. Um, and because of that, I would wager to say that most collections that you manage likely um, will also not fall under these particular conditions and are probably going to be under the first two. But I would go ahead and take a look at that chart and familiarize yourself as it's really helpful. Um, so now that we have the groundwork for what co what is required for a copyright designation, we're going to talk a little bit about what rights statements are. Um, so what exactly are rights statements? Ultimately, rights statements are statements that give the parameters of how someone can interact with a digital object and should also include information on the copyright status. The copyright status is whether something is in copyright in the public domain, but sometimes that status may also not be known. Um, and it is important to include that information too. Right statements should be able to answer questions like these. Can the user reuse a digital object if they are a student? What about if the user wants to reproduce it commercially? Can they do that? Right statements should clearly define and describe what actions a person can or cannot take with a given object. If you're not exactly sure what should go into a right statement, you don't have a legal professional available to you, there are standardized right statements that are available um, to your institution. Some of you, as we noticed earlier, uh, may be familiar with Creative Commons licenses. Um, and perhaps some of you are familiar with the rightstatements.org statements. Um, but maybe you don't know um, why you would use one or the other. Licenses can only be granted by the creator of a work. These are really useful for institutional repositories where the author or creator of a work is able to choose their own licenses and determine what permissions they would like to grant to users. Most of the material in cultural heritage institutions digital collections are not able to be released with the license because the institution is not the original creator of the work, which is why writestatements.org was created. Rightstatements.org is intended for use by cultural heritage institutions who want to convey the right status and use of an item to users, even though they may not be the creator of a work. Later, we will be digging deeper into how to use these statements. So here are two examples of a similar rights type. Both are describing non-commercial use. However, the Creative Commons rights is a license that is granted by the creator of a work, whereas the bottom example is used by an organization that does not necessarily own the copyright to the work. So as previously mentioned, right statements can describe whether an object is in copyright or not. Um, and even if a copyright status is unknown, uh, is unknown um, that is helpful to note in the right statement as well. A right statement can also describe any of the rights that are held in and over the item being described beyond copyright. Um, and lastly, it can describe the entity, whether that's a person or a corporate body, that is the rights holder of the item being described. And a right statement can come in two different forms. Um, one is a URI or a un uniform resource identifier, like the statements from ratestatements.org. Um, the URI is a machine-readable identifier that can then be transformed into a human-readable version made up of text and visual icons. The second form of rights statements can come in as a free text statement, and these are currently the more common of the two forms used, and it is the easiest to implement. 
Here we have five examples of write statements that are useful and clear to a user. The first two examples are URIs as the machine sees them. The first is a write statements.org um, write statement for the designation in copyright educational use permitted um, with the parentheses not actually being part of the URI. They're just a visual cue to you what they are. We'll see an example of a write statements or URI in action in a moment. Um, and the uh, second URI there is the co Creative Commons license. The third is an example of an, for an item that is in the public domain. Generally, because the cases of a public domain item have restrictions is rare, um, statements for public domain items tend to be fairly short. Um, and oftentimes we'll say simply, this item is in the public domain. The fourth example is for an item that is in copyright. This particular statement also describes the use restrictions. In this case, the item can be used for personal education and non-commercial use, and it must credit where it is from. This indicates to the user what its uh, copyright status is, and it can be used, and if they need more information, there is an email address for the user to turn to. Lastly, here is an example of when copyright is undetermined. This conveys uh, that the library has undertaken a review of the rights of the item, but was not able to make a firm determination of the rights. This is more specific than stating that the rights are unknown because it conveys that the library made an effort to determine what those rights were, um, even if that was not conclusive. So here is an example of a free text rights statement that describes that the item um, is in uh, the public domain. Um, this is conveyed in a simple yet very understandable term that is clear to the user. Like I said before, very short, very simple. There we go. All right. Um, and in this example, a URI is used for the rights statement, which is populated in the rights statement field, um, as well as an icon represent representation above that. How this will be displayed will be dependent on the content management system. Um, and later we will see examples of how information gets displayed in the DPLA user interface. Um, and just before we uh, move on, I wanted to mention that currently I don't believe that Content DM is able to populate any fields with um, information um, with that URI, but um, I think that it might be something that they're looking into, though I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, now that we have covered what makes for a good rate statement, we'll talk about what shouldn't be in the rights field. Um, first and foremost, a rate statement should always convey the rights about the object being described. So if the information in the rights field doesn't do that, then it isn't a rights statement. Similarly, a rights statement should not be comp comprised of only contact donor or funding information. Um, vague and inaccurate information should also be avoided because it isn't helpful to the user. Inaccurate information would include declaring an item as being in copyright when it is in fact not, um, like implying a copyright statement that is based on the digitization date instead of the date of creation or publication. Also, URLs should not be used in place of a right statement. There are several reasons for this. Um, the first being that URLs are not a right statement in and of themselves. Um, and secondly, URLs break really easily. Um, so they can be implemented with really great intentions, but if the link breaks, the user won't know what may be related to the item, let alone whom to contact. So um, it's recommended to avoid those. So here are some statements that are not particularly useful in a rights field. So the first is contact information and does not describe copyright in any way. It doesn't leave the user hanging entirely because it guides them to where they can obtain more information, but it really doesn't go beyond that information. Um, so we have that phone number, we have an email, but it doesn't say anything about the rights of that particular item. The second is a name only, and we, as a user, may come along and wonder whether uh, Joel Christensen is the donor, the rights holder, the author, or some other related person. The point is there is no contextual information about who this person is, let alone what they have to do with the rights, item, with the rights of the item in question. Third, we have an example of vague and unclear terms. Um, the statement initially states that copyright may belong to the authors or their legal heirs or assigns, but then it is immediately followed by all rights reserved by the research library. 
All rights reserved essentially means in copyright. So it's really unclear to the user who the copyright belongs to, whether that's the author or legal assigns, or if it belongs to the research library. Ultimately, it makes it difficult for that person to know who to contact about um, using something. Uh, the fourth is an example of a URL, which as previously mentioned, isn't great practice. Um, it also appears that it goes out to a page about copyright, which is useful in some ways, but boilerplate pages are not useful for a user determining how they can use a specific item. Um, and last, stating who the material is made by, uh, made available by, is in effect meaningless. This is more of a description and means little else. Um, again, this statement is not does not describe copyright in any way, so it's not great to use that. Um, as I'm sure many of you can imagine, some of the rights information you may have stumbled upon leave something to be desired. Um, here is an example of contact information being used in the rights section, but there is no information about the copyright status or how a user can interact with the digital object. Now that we have covered what a rights statement is in general, let's talk a little more specifically about what a standardized rights statement is. We've touched on this briefly throughout the presentation thus far, but now we're going to discuss standardized rights statements in more detail. In, particularly, in particular, we are going to be discussing rightsstatements.org and how those can be used in digital collections. To give a little background on where these came from, um, RightsStatements.org was a joint initiative between the DPLA um, and Europeana, which is the European portal to digital cultural heritage objects, which is very similar to DPLA just in Europe. Um, then we also part of that joint initiative was the New York Public Library, Tennisland of New Zealand, Michigan University, and the Luxembourg National Library. Of those institutions, there were two working groups, uh, the, right, the International Rights Statements Working Group and the Technical Working Group. The International Rights Statements Working Group was the group responsible for developing the statements themselves and determining the use and in interna international application. Uh, the Technical Working Group was the group responsible for developing the URIs and the technical infrastructure for how the statements would operate. Standardized rights statements were developed in particular with a global approach in mind so that they could be used internationally and would be appropriate for copyright within many countries. This was especially important since Europeana encompasses all of the EU countries and they wanted these statements to be usable by all. The individuals that made up the International Rights Statements Working Group were comprised of librarians, metadata aggregators, and lawyers, all of which bringing a unique yet important perspective in the development of these statements. As of April of this year, uh, rightsstatements.org has been live on the internet for two years. So now that we have established where they originally it originated from, let's discuss what they are. So we touched on this earlier in the presentation, but rightsstatements.org is a controlled vocabulary of rights statements with 12 statements to choose from. All 12 rights statements are available as URIs. There are three categories that the statements fall into. We have in copyright, not in copyright, and other. So why was there a need to create rightsstatements.org? For one, it standardizes the language that is used in digital collections. To give you an idea of why this was important to DPLA in particular, um, was that at the time of the creation of rightsstatements.org, DPLA had over 87,000 different rights statements in their portal. By simplifying the terms used in a rights statement, users can have a more fluid experience in a service provider's portal. Using standardized language also strips away ambiguous language that can sometimes cloud free text rights statements, even when those statements were written with the best of intentions. Another benefit to utilizing standardized language is that it takes the burden off of cultural heritage institutions to determine and create the best language to describe the rights on the items in their collections. This is especially useful for smaller institutions that may not have a copyright librarian or, or other copyright officials on staff available to help them. Because these rights statements have all been vetted for their usefulness and legal accuracy, institutions can feel confident using them on their digital objects. 
Lastly, these URI-based write statements are both human and machine readable, meaning that a machine can process the URI and populate certain fields and spaces with the correct information or icons, which can then be read and easily understood by people. As I previously mentioned, there are three categories of write statements from writestatements.org. The first is in copyright. This is for works that are in copyright. Pretty straightforward. We will not be discussing the write statement in copyright EU orphan works as this specifically pertains to those that are under the jurisdiction of the EU. And because we are not under that jurisdiction, we're going to pass that particular statement up. Um, the second is no copyright. This is for works that are no longer in copyright. And then the last is other, which is for statements where the copyright status may be unclear, unknown, or undetermined. We'll begin with the category of in copyright. There are three separate right statements that fall under this category. We have in copyright, in copyright educational use permitted, and in copyright non-commercial use permitted. This is an example of what an in copyright educational use permitted right statement looks like in the DPLA portal. You will notice that the standardized right statement in the center of the page includes the text of the right statement and under the thumbnail at the top of the page is the icon for this particular right statement. In the, um, and in the DPLA portal, all rightstatements.org statements will be populated in these two areas. So the in copyright rights statement is intended to cover items that are still in copyright and don't have any specific use exceptions. This should only be used for items where it is known for a fact that the item is under copyright. If there is any doubt about whether an item is in copyright, then another right statement should be used. For this statement, the text states that this item is protected by copyright and or related rights. You are free to use this item in any way that is permitted by the copyright and related rights legislation that applies to your use. For other uses, you need to obtain permission from the rights holder. Um, next, we have the in copyright educational use permitted rights statement. Um, which is pretty much as it sounds. Um, it is intended for items that are in copyright but have an educational use exception. This means that people using an item for an educational use can use it freely, but anyone using the item for any other purpose needs to get permission from the rights holder. The text for this statement declares that the item is protected by copyright and or related rights. You are free to use this item in any way that is permitted by the copyright and related rights legislation that applies to your use. In addition, no permission is required for the rights holder um, from the rights holder for educational uses. For other uses, you need to obtain permission from the rights holder. This is the final in copyright statement. It is the non-commercial use permitted right statement and should be used for items that are both in copyright and have non-commercial use exceptions. This extends beyond educational use and opens up the permissions to include anyone that is using the item in, in a way that does not generate income. This statement says, this item is protected by copyright and or related rights. You are free to use this item in any way that is permitted by the copyright and related le rights legislation that applies to your use. In addition, no permission is required from the rights holder for non-commercial uses. For other uses, you need to obtain permission from the rights holder. Next up are the right statements that are not in copyright. This includes items that are in the public domain. Though the right statements org does not call it this, and I'll explain more later as to what this means and why. There are four right statements that fit under this category. No copyright contractual restrictions, no copyright non-commercial use only, no copyright other known legal restrictions, and no copyright United States. Here's an object that is not in copyright. You'll notice that the language in this uh, statement is slightly different from the in copyright statement that we saw before, and the icon under the thumbnail is different as well. You have a C with a slash instead of the open C. The first right statement for items no longer in copyright is no copyright contractual restrictions. This is to be used for items that are not in copyright but may have cultural viewing restrictions or privacy issues. Some examples might be for items where a digitized item is not, um, nor has ne 
nor has it ever been in copyright, but the culture that the item comes from has viewing restrictions, perhaps being something that only elders of a community may view, for example. This is common in non-Western communities and may come up when digitizing items coming from indigenous communities. Um, the right statement for this states that use of this item is not restricted by copyright and or related rights. As part of the acquisition or digitization of this item, the organization has made the item available is contractually required to limit the use of this item. Limitations may include but are not limited to privacy issues, cultural protections, and digitization agreements or donor agreements. Please refer to the organization that has made the item available for more information. The second no copyright right statement is for non-commercial use only. This should be used for items that are not in copyright but were digitized in a public-private partnership such as public institution and Google um, and allows for non-commercial use exceptions. The right statement for this says, this object has been digitized in a public-private partnership. As part of this partnership, the partners have agreed to limit commercial uses of this digital representation of the object by third parties. You can, without permission, copy, modify, distribute, display, or perform the digital object for non-commercial uses. For any other permissible uses, please review the terms and conditions of the organization that has made the item available. The third right statement for items that are not in copyright is no copyright, other known legal restrictions. This is very similar to the no copyright contractual restrictions right statement, except that instead of the restrictions being explicitly built into a contract, there are other legal restrictions at play. Again, this may be a case of cultural heritage or traditional cultural expression protections. So when determining which is appropriate, it will be important to understand the difference between the two right statements. This statement declares that use of this item is not restricted by copyright and or related rights. In one or more jur jurisdictions, laws other than copyright are known to impose restrictions on the use of this item. Please refer to the organization that has made the item available for more information. The last right statement in this particular category is no copyright United States. This is essentially a public domain declaration, but is labeled as no copyright United States because these right statements are intended for inter international use and public domain laws vary dep depending on the jurisdiction. This particular statement is only applicable to items published or created in the United States and are no longer in copyright. The statement says that the organization that has made the item available believes that the item is in the public domain under the laws of the United States, but a determination was not made as to its copyright status under the copyright laws of other countries. The item may not be in the public domain under the laws of other countries. Please refer to the organization that has made, item, that has made the item available for more information. The third category of rights statement is other, which is used for statements for items where the copyright status is unclear or unknown. These are for items you may not be certain of the copyright status or that the copyright status may be entirely unknown. There are three separate rights statements that fall under this category. First, we have copyright not evaluated, we have copyright undetermined, and then last we have no known copyright. So here is an example of a copyright undetermined right statement with the appropriate icon under the thumbnail. You'll see that this particular icon has a question mark instead of a copyright C with or without a slash. This signifies to the user that there is some degree of uncertainty regarding the copyright for an item. Um, so the first right statement in this category is copyright not evaluated. This means exactly what it sounds like in that an institution has made something available in a digital collection that has not um, made any effort to determine whether the item is or is not in copyright. Um, this particular right statement has generated a lot of discussion amongst the early adopters of rightstatements.org. Um, as there is an argument that the statement should never be used because institutions should make some sort of an effort to evaluate what copyright status is on an item, or at least in broad sweeps for collections in which an item is a part. However, there are many reasons why this right statement might be used. And for example, if the item 
um, or if the rates on an item are retroactively added in digital collections where the initial policy did not outline that any rate statement needed to be included on items, um, there is an argument for the use of this rate statement in that particular case. That being said, it is recommended that this particular rate statement be used sparingly and not applied as a default. The statement declares that the copyright and related rights status of this item has not been evaluated. Please refer to the organization that has made the item available for more information. You are free to use this item in any way that is permitted by the copyright and related rights legislation that applies to your use. The second right statement in this category is copyright undetermined. This is for items where the institution has made an effort to determine the copyright status but was unable to conclude for certain what the copyright status is. This is meant to alert the user that the institution has put some effort into trying to locate information about copyright status, but ultimately nothing was conclusive. This is helpful for users um, for how users may proceed with the digital object. The statement states that the copyright and related rights statement, or sorry, the copyright and related rights status of this item has been reviewed by the organization that has been made that has made the item available, but the organization was unable to make a conclusive determination as to the copyright status of the item. Please refer to the organization that has made the item available for more information. You are free to use this item in any way that is permitted by the copyright and related rights legislation that applies to your use. Um, and then we have no known copyright, which is the last right statement in this category. This is for items where an item is believed to not be in copyright, but the, the institution making the item available was not able to make a 100% conclusive determination. Many objects in digital collections fall into this category, especially in the case where, they, where there may not be information about the provenance, author, or publisher of an item. This is useful in cases where all signs point to an object being in the public domain, but there isn't any formal information that justifies this. This differs from copyright undetermined in that copyright undetermined does not necessarily mean that the institution believes that the item is in the public domain. This right statement declares that the organization that has made the item available reasonably believes that the item is not restricted by copyright or related rights, but a conclusive determination could not be made. Please refer to the organization that has made the item available for more information. You are free to use this item in any way that is permitted by the copyright and related rights legislation that applies to your use. So to review what we have discussed in uh, the last uh, 40 minutes or so, um, we talked about copyright and the requirements that need to be fulfilled in order to obtain a new copyright. We only covered the tip of the iceberg, um, but I would recommend that you all uh, dig deeper with future copyright webinars and presentations to get more comfortable with copyright. You will have an opportunity to do this in a few weeks with Sarah Benson when she will talk about copyright. And that is happening on August 1st, I believe, at 10 a.m. We also discussed what is a right statement as well as what should and should not be included in that right statement. Remember, it is really important to describe the copyright status and ideally the use restrictions as well in a right statement. Finally, we discussed the statements from rightstatements.org and how those can be applied to items in a digital collection. So at this point, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those now. Um, and if you would feel more comfortable, you may email me at the email on your screen there. Um, and I can respond to that later as well. My email is h-a-n-n-a-h-e-s at illinois.edu. Um, and like I said, uh, Louise sent out some questions earlier last week, um, and we'll be answering some of those. And I think that Sarah is going to be joining us on the call shortly if she is not already here. Um, and she'll be helping answering answer questions as well. Um, so at this point, I think we are ready to take questions, Louise. All right. Um, thank, thank you, Hannah. Um, Sarah is online. Um, I don't okay. know, Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself, I think you can join in the conversation. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Okay, welcome. Um, I haven't received any questions yet from the audience um, during the webinar, um, so just 
just encourage everyone, as, you know, as we're wrapping up here, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type those in. Um, while you're thinking of that, I just wanted to mention that Sarah is going to be doing a webinar, um, actually Hannah just mentioned this a moment ago, called Librarian Copyright Superpowers. Um, which will take a broader view of copyright. Uh, she'll talk about interlibrary loan preservation and fair use. And I put a link to uh, the events listing in the calendar and it's in your uh, questions box right now if you want to take a look at that. We've got plenty of space. Um, but I the questions that came up. On, oh, sorry. I was just working on the slides for that and I'm happy okay. to share them in advance with anyone who wants to take a look at them. So if you're considering doing it and you're thinking, is this helpful to me? You can definitely look at the slides and make that assessment. Okay, great. Great. Okay, so the questions that came in in advance, um, there were three that we decided were most appropriate for today's uh, discussion. So the first one, um, was how do you handle newspaper clippings where the newspaper publisher no longer exists or is non-responsive to inquiries? And there was a second part to that question about scrapbooks of local history that may or not have a publisher or author attached and how do you notate copyright for those articles? And I'm, these three questions I'm hopefully Sarah will answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I've lost my track. <laughs> so, so let's start with the first one. Can you repeat the question and then I'll, I'll sure. give my best shot. Sure. How do you handle newspaper clippings where the newspaper publisher no longer exists or is non-responsive to inquiries? Okay. So that's a really good question. And this happens a lot in copyright, which is, you know, it's really easy to ask permission when you know who owns the copyright. Unfortunately, we have a lot of works out there that what we are what we call orphan works, where despite our best efforts, we cannot find the copyright owner. And there's been a lot of um, research on that. And I'm actually really interested in orphan works and what what constitutes a quote unquote diligent search for a an author, um, especially if an entity that owned the copyright is now defunct. Um, and normally with newspapers, the owner is the newspaper itself because usually the authors um, are uh, under a work made for hire arrangement with the newspaper, but that's not true for every single thing written in the newspaper. Anyway, it gets complicated fast. And um, my response to this is, you know, do a search, try to figure out, you know, who owns the copyright. Sometimes what happens with um, copyright is after that they expire, um, they revert to the authors, but that would make it really hard, right? Because you'd have a lot of authors in a new newspaper. So at some point, you're probably going to find yourself doing a fair use assessment, I'm thinking, right? Because you're you're gonna, especially with a newspaper where you don't know who owns it, there might be lots of different owners and then, you know, who are their heirs and all of this, it gets very complicated. Um, so a lot of times what we do as librarians in that situation is we do a fair use assessment and say, you know, is it a fair use to make this work available? And usually with newspapers since it's so fact specific and it's also like time limited right you're not replacing a marketplace for a newspaper that was from 1950s right or what have you because back then they sold it and they made a profit no one cares today about 1950s news unless they're doing you know historical research or something of that sort so at some level i think you're going to end up in a fair use land where you're going to make an assessment is it a fair use to share this resource and my best guess without having looked at that particular article or that newspaper is that it probably is a fair use like i said you're not replacing a marketplace it's highly factual, people are interested in it for research and scholarship and all of those things that fair use cares about. Um, and that's where we get to often with orphan works is we end up in fair use land because, you know, after we have done a diligent search, we try to find the copyright owner so we can ask for permission. But a lot of times um, we just cannot locate that that owner and we end up making a fair use assessment and using our good judgment. 
So I want to kind of tag um, onto that and to bring it back to specifically write statements. Um, if you were going to use a standardized write statement, um, you could use either no, uh, sorry, copyright undetermined, because um, that at least tells the user that you made some sort of effort into finding out who has the copyright and if that copyright status is currently um, active or not. Um, and it, it at least points the user in, in the right direction. Yeah, and I think that that's, it's not a bad idea to also notate somewhere, and this may be behind the scenes, that you made a fair use determination, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know some folks, though, who do it publicly, like at MIT for their open educational resources, for instance, they will note on the actual um, image or photograph that they're using that they are using it under fair use so that if someone else tries to use it they understand that you know they would have to get permission or do their own fair use assessment um i know the um standardized right statements don't really have a, a right a statement that says this is used under fair use but i think mm -hmm. you know you could notate that in your own records just for your own awareness that like we put this particular designation on it publicly and we did it um, because we couldn't, you know, it was an orphan work and we did a fair use assessment. Yep. All right, so just to follow up on that, um, I had one of our audience members just said that their local collection, history collection has a number of scrapbooks with original photographs and letters and newspaper clippings from random places. So if those items are digitized, I, I, she just wants to clarify, would it be considered no copyright, you know, that there's no copyright on these without any problem? Or what, what, what do you suggest um, they do in a situation like that? Well, there, there probably is a copyright on them, but it depends. And this is where next week we get into this in more detail about, you know, what what era are they from? So it also the one of the terminations that matters for copyright um, purposes is whether the item is published or unpublished. Um, unpublished works actually are usually protected longer under copyright. Um, and published works, um, they expire a little bit sooner. And, and there were what we call formalities um, between 1923 and 1978 for published works. So if you didn't put a copyright notice on it, for instance, you waived copyright in that era. And if you um, didn't register it at the right time and or you didn't renew it at the right time, you might lose copyright. But I'm, let me just assume for now the newspaper articles are going to be published like they were published and so they would have had to have followed some of those formalities if you're talking about older era newspapers i'm assuming you're not talking about like yesterday's news but if you're talking about photographs and um, letters letters in particular probably were unpublished um, then you're kind of in a different realm. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not copyright protected. They probably are. The question is, how do you designate um, when you put them online, if you decide you're going to, right? Because, you know, of course, if we know that they're in the public domain, there's no issue. You can put it online. That's great. Anybody can use it, you know, yada, yada. But we digitize and put things online that are, potentially in the under copyright often maybe under a fair use assessment as I noted with the last question about the newspaper you know if you decide hey I'm not really usurping any marketplace I'm putting this online for educational use maybe you're not making it like completely available and maybe you're making it available to people in your like library um, but you still would need to indicate or you would want to indicate some kind of right statement there. So then you would have to decide, you know, have I have I really determined the copyright status, right? If it's an orphan work and you just don't know, that's where you just can't, you don't wanna say no copyright at all because that's just not accurate. You wanna say, you know, either copyright undetermined or copyright, um, uh, what were you saying, Hannah? Was the other one we were talking about besides um, copyright? 
copyright, yeah, copyright undetermined, and then there's also no known copyright if you think that it is in the public domain, but you're not 100% sure. Sure, so if you think that it's in the public domain, let's say you think it was published under your determination of what published means, which can get really tricky. You're like, okay, it was published, there's no copyright notice on it, so I'm gonna say, um, you know, yeah, it, it's probably in the public domain, but I'm not 100% sure. You might say no known copyright, but you don't want to say no copyright at all, right? Because that's not really telling me as a user what you mean there. Like, is it public domain? That's different than no, no copyright. It means copyright has expired. Or is it like, I just don't know, which is undetermined. So you kind of want to be careful with that language and copyright, I wish it were simpler. It's not that easy, but what um, Hannah pointed out is Peter Hurdle's chart early on in this seminar. I was kind of lurking in the background <laughs> and listening to what she was saying. Um, Peter Hurdle's chart is really, really valuable because what it does is it breaks down the copyright eras and also it breaks down whether thing, something is published versus unpublished. And it really helps you determine, you know, what what do I need to be looking for to determine if this is still under copyright? And um, like I said, it can get complicated quickly, but the chart really goes a long way in helping. And the other thing I wanna point out is that copyright law is not retroactive. And what that means is that the law from today is not the same law that applied in 1922. And that is why copyright law in the US is so confusing because today the copyright law is pretty clear, right? We don't have any formalities. We can, anything that I write down that's minimally creative is, is copyright protected. That's easy. I don't need to put a copyright notice on it. I don't need to file it with the copyright office. I don't need to do any of those things. But in 1921, I did have to do certain things. And also the copyright term has changed as well. So the copyright term used to be a set 95 years after the date of publication back in 1922, which um, is why that's the magic date for the public domain, because if you do 1922 plus 95, you come up with 2017. And so everything's expired from that year um, if it was published in the US. But today we know that the copyright term is 70 years after the death date of the author, which is a very harder moving target to find because we start having to look up what death dates of people. So it's it, it was a little easier to determine when it was just based on the date of publication or the year of publication, whereas now it's based on the, the death date of the author. So anyway, copyright law is a moving target depending on the year that you're talking about and depending on whether it's published or unpublished, and depending on whether it's a work made for hire or it is a individual author, depending on whether the copyright's been transferred and it's maybe been transferred multiple times. And so there's a lot, there's a lot there, <laughs> which is why I have a job. <laughs> I would also like to point out that a lot of times um, libraries don't get in trouble like legally Oftentimes, if there is any concern, there will be a takedown request. Um, so if you're concerned about putting stuff online at all, um, you know, you can also pub put that up there with um, some sort of notice that says that people can request that the item be taken down if it belongs to them. Um, and that was just something that I wanted to include as well because because of Sarah saying that things are so complicated if you're really not sure but you think that something is within your right to put online um, but you do have that caveat there's that as well um, just as a well, note yeah well that's a good segue into the next question is you know have there been any adverse court decisions regarding libraries and copyright especially as as libraries are publishing more digital content? Yeah, so the answer to that is that libraries are very special and they are very highly regarded as a special institution under copyright law, right? So the reason my talk is titled Library Superpowers is because 
we as librarians get to do a lot of stuff within copyright works, even though the copyright is still applying, we're still allowed to digitize, we're allowed to um, interlibrary loan things, and things that other people can't do and for-profit institutions cannot do. And so, I yeah, I don't want to scare people off, not at all. I mean, so the answer to that is we are very fortunate. So Section 108 is our preservation, archiving, and interlibrary loan, and like a bunch of other things are in there. Um, a lot of stuff that we do day to day that involves making copies of um, works that are copyright protected. And I'll tell you what, libraries have almost never been sued under Section 108. If you look up Section 108, in the United States Code Annotated, which is the code that has like all the court cases, you'll find like two cases total ever, and they're really not even like really helpful. I mean, they're just, so basically libraries are special and we don't usually get sued. Um, and I don't wanna say we don't ever get sued though, because there is a very long uh, lawsuit that's going on at Georgia State University and the libraries were most certainly part of it, about e-reserves and that's still going on now. Georgia State has been winning hand over fist. They've been winning, but it's been going on for a very long time. Um, and the Hathi Trust Digital Library, as we all know, was sued. Um, but those, those cases were different because they were about fair use. They were not about Section 108. So Section 108 is a very specific set of exceptions that allows the library to make preservation copies and interlibrary loan copies and distribution. And that's where we haven't been sued. The place where we have been sued is under fair use. And we've been largely, at least lately, been winning those cases. So it's it's not bad news. It's just, you know, nobody wants to be sued ever because it's expensive. Although I've heard um, the dean at our library, at least, was part of that lawsuit and said it wasn't actually that expensive in the Hathi Trust case. Um, but still, I don't want to like say, yeah, go out and do whatever you want. Um, there are a lot of safeguards, one of which is sovereign immunity, which allows um, if you're a state library, state run library, um, then you they can't get actual damages against you. They can just get injunctions and tell you to stop doing things, which is what Hannah was alluding to. Like, that's what a takedown notice essentially is, is saying, hey, stop doing this. I don't like that. And usually if you comply with it, um, the, that satisfies the person. Um, and that's what these lawsuits often are about because people are just like, no, we don't want to stop doing this. So that's where they start, you know, suing people is when you don't abide by the takedown notice, you start putting up a fight about it. And Hathi Trust did that. And Georgia State has been kind of fighting back too. So um, that was a long winded way of saying, don't be scared. Even in fair use, don't be scared, feel empowered, um, come to my seminar, learn about it, learn what you can do, and then, you know, go forth and use your superpowers wisely. And, you know, librarians are special and we do have special copyright powers. And um, as long as you exercise fair use with good faith, um, then you're usually in a good place. All right, well, just to follow up on that, uh, an audience has a member has asked, is there some place where there is sample wording for that statement about, you know, requests for takedown? That's a really good question. I think most libraries have a page where they say, you know, if you want us to take this down, I'm sure, I'm sure University of Illinois has many of those such pages, right, Hannah? Yeah. Well, and I think um, Columbia University has uh, some good information about um, their their fair use and takedown, um, and I can try to find that. I, I and that might even I'm not sure if that got onto the the um, the handout or not. But um, Columbia University does have good language around that. Mm -hmm. And most libraries, I mean, a lot of libraries have that language somewhere, and most universities have that language somewhere because they're required. Um, what happens is you have less liability if you're just an internet service provider or you're just providing service to, like, um, provide, um, 
you know, allow your faculty to post things and things like that. And then if you have, you know, a, a takedown uh, ability, then that kind of provides you with a level of security that you're not just going to get sued all the time, that they will just like contact you, say, take this down, you take it down, and that's the end of that. Um, I would say, though, that you also, even if you get a random takedown notice, the person sending that takedown notice really should be doing a fair use assessment before sending it. So if you are making a fair use, you don't have to immediately respond and like take down whatever they tell you to take down. A lot of times, um, if you feel it's a fair use, you can write back and say, you know, this is justified under Section 107 of the Copyright Act. It's a fair use. Here's why, blah, 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 and see what they say to that. Because really, if it is a fair use and it's a justified use, then you really shouldn't have to take it down. Um, so that's just another thing to be aware of with those takedown notices okay. and requests. All right. Great. Well, we had a, a like three or four questions come up towards the end of the webinar, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump into those. Um, so the first one is, do rights statements need to be present for every object in a digital collection? Yes. Emphatically, yes. Um, because if you don't have if you don't have them, then a user isn't going to know how they are going to be able to interact with them. And that means that you are doing a disservice to that user. Um, they are, they won't know if they can use that in an educational setting, if they need to contact the library about permissions, or if they need to contact somebody else. Um, and what you're really doing is you're creating a really um, negative user experience if they do want to use that item. Um, legally, I, you know, I think that that is something that you should be doing always as well. Um, but from a user's perspective, you, re you really want to have a right statement on everything. And I will say from the legal standpoint, you're in a much better place if you're doing a fair use assessment on a case by case basis than on a collection level basis, because in fact, courts consistently say that fair use is not a broad swath kind of assessment. It, it depends on every single item. So you have to look at each item. You can't just say this whole collection is fair use because it's all educational. You have, you're really supposed to go through each item and make an individual determination. And so if you're being that specific, that's when those right statements um, should be specific to each item. Um, but understandably, you know, if you're going back and trying to put right statements on older collections, it might take some time to mm -hmm. really get that done. I mean, I don't think anyone expects like overnight, you're going to have right statements on every single thing. It's going to take a little while. Um, and so, um, you know, you might want to let users know like, we're in the process of, you know, adding right statements to this collection, please be patient or something like that so that they understand like you're doing it, but you're not, you're not done. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that um, you can add things in, um, you can add in right statements um, in a, as a batch, um, but that is in very rare circumstances where all of the items in the collection fall within a very specific time frame. They're all, um, they were all published or unpublished. Um, Basically, they all have the same right status. Um, and because so many collections do not um, uh, fall within those very specific terms, um, that's, that's when you have to dig in a little bit more and uh, make those individual assessments. Um, and as I said earlier, you can use the right statement um, uh, copyright not evaluated, but really don't do that unless you absolutely have to. And it, those are good as um, placeholders, but they shouldn't be, that shouldn't be your long-term solution for your right statement. Okay. Um, the next question was, we might need some clarification on this, but it, uh, the person says, I believe your initial statement were, were 12 statements 
Um, but they said they only see 11 on your slides. So they're wondering what they missed. Yeah, so um, so there was the, um, the EU one, um, the EU Orphan Works. And then there's also, um, I forgot to add this one in because this was based off of, um, uh, Carly has, they're, they're only using the 11, I think. Um, and then that, that missing one is uh, in copyright, copyright holder unlocatable. And I think if I'm correct, that it was one that I didn't go over. Um, but that it's, again, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, where the uh, copyright holder is, you can't find that person, um, and the um, the whole definition of that is on rightsstatements.org. And I'm I'm sorry that I'm kind of blanking on that more specifically, but um, if that's something that's applicable to your collections, which is common, um, you might find that information helpful there. Okay. Uh, the next question, what about special libraries that are in a for-profit corporation? I mean, how, does, how do these rights statements or copyright affect them? Um, I mean, the rights statements are... Or is there anything, just... anything different that they would need to consider because they're not uh, public or academic type library um, with the with right statements org, not really there's not really any difference because it's based off of um, the the copyright status and the copyright status doesn't change depending on um, you know who the um, the owning institution is now it might de depend on if there was a transfer of rights um, but the the application of those right statements is not dependent on the type of institution that you are. Um, I will say that individuals who are wanting to apply those right statements, like if they were the creator of some sort of um, object, um, the right statements org is not appropriate in that case. In that case, you would use Creative Commons, but a, as far as um, public versus private institution who's wanting to make things available, um, because those right statements are based off of the copyright status, it really shouldn't change anything. And okay. I would just say from the copyright standpoint, um, it may make a big difference in terms of your ability to rely on Section 108, which are the copyright exceptions and interlibrary loan and things of that sort, which the requirement, one of the requirements to avail yourself of those exceptions is that you are open to researchers specialized in the field and you allow people into your library. So if you don't, for instance, if you're a law firm library and you're and, and a competitor law firm wants to come in and they're like, can we use your resources? And you say no, um, then you cannot avail yourself of Section 108. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that it might impact your fair use analysis where um, often the first well the first consideration is whether it's for a commercial purpose or a nonprofit or educational purpose and you may fa fall more on the scale of commercial in that analysis it doesn't mean that you can't use fair use because commercial entities use fair use all the time you can read the google books case and um, google is obviously a for-profit entity it's just one of the factors and so you it would it might change your fair use analysis a bit so it does matter in terms of like your own um, ability to use copyright in the Copyright Act and um, fair use and things but I think what Hannah's saying is you know the work itself is either copyright protected or not copyright protected but it might change your analysis about whether you want to make that work available on, let's say, your corporate website or something like that um, versus a, um, you know, public nonprofit library. They might feel a little more comfortable with the fair use um, analysis 
where you might not. I think that that's where it's a kind of a different risk assessment. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to um, the last question we had received in advance. Um, when is educational fair use a good fit for covering non-commercial access to archival recordings? And is there a good template for an agreement between copyright holders to make the recording available? Again, I'm going to punt this to Sarah. Archi I don't know what they mean by archival recording. That's, I guess, are you talking about like a moving video? Or are you talking about an audio? Louise, is that? I'm not that sure. That came in, in advance, and I'm not sure if that person is, is on a webinar or not. But. OK. Um, well, <laughs> let me just think does it, this. Does it matter if it's audio or video? Does that have different? Well, I mean, it might have restrictions. Um, I don't, well, I it, probably it doesn't, but I guess it, it, it makes me think also I'm trying to understand if it's like something that was published or something that was unpublished. Mm -hmm. So it might be like, you know, my like doctor's notes or something or like my like dissertation notes that I audio recorded or like lectures that were audio recorded. Um, I'm thinking for in an archive, you know, it could be that it was not published material or it could be that it was published. So I really that's where I'm getting a little bit confused about like it, I mean, sometimes what happens with reference reference interviews with copyright is that I have to dig in really deeply about exactly what it is that you're talking about because it seems it seems like oh an archival tape but I don't know if this tape was you know mass distributed or was this like the only tape in the world because that really does make a big difference um, but let me just let me just assume it's like something that's pretty unique um, and like a tape record like an oral tape recording um, I would say, you know, can you make a copy of it for archiving, for preservation? Absolutely, definitely you can, and that's section 108, because what you're doing there is you are preserving something that was not published and that is unique. And the Copyright Act, again, recognizes us as librarians as the keepers of history and knowledge and allows us to, even if it's copyright protected, make that copy because it may be the only copy ever. Now, the, the the difference here is are you making an analog copy like you're making a, you know, tape recording to a tape recording or are you making a digital copy? Um, and it, you are allowed to do a digital copy, but the difference is you're not allowed to make that digital copy, quote unquote, available to the public except on the premises. And this is where it just gets really, really complicated. So, so I guess in terms of like, you know, are you going to put it on some web page? You're not really supposed to do that. What you're what you're supposed to do is, you know, if they come into the library, they could play it, you know, on a computer's terminal like in the library um, or maybe, um, you know, log in through the VPN if you want to interpret premises pretty broadly. Um, but you're not supposed to just like email it to people and things like that. Um, so that that's like my answer. I don't know if I answered the question at all, really, but it's hard without the person here. <laughs> I mean, if the person is here, feel free to send a message and say, yeah, that was what I was asking or no. Um, but I think that's what they were asking. Um, are there any other questions or does, is that, does that, is that if, if that person is here, maybe they'll clarify, but. Sorry, my microphone was muted. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if that person is, is on uh, the webinar or not, but if they are, um, they can uh, please type in the questions box if you have anything to, to add or clarify that question. But I have one last question that's, that's kind of similar and this involves a, a school district who um, is thinking about digitizing movies 
and films and keeping them on their own server for the students to um, access. Um, and these would be DVDs that are purchased by the district. Um, is this a copyright violation if it's just internal for the students? So yes, sadly it is, and I've I've had this question come up before. And one the one of the ways that this question came up was I had a school librarian who said, you know, we buy these DVDs and we allow the students to borrow them, but I'm afraid they're going to lose them. Can I make backup copies? And I said, I wish I could tell you yes, but you're not allowed to do that. Um, and you know, one of the better ways to make these things available is through like an online streaming um, service like Canopy um, or what's the other one? Um, there's another service, not Netflix, because Netflix doesn't license to libraries, um, but it's kind of like Netflix. A fair amount. What does? Hoopla. Hoopla, yeah, Hoopla, Canopy. There's some other ones available. And um, a lot of times, at least our licensing with Canopy is great because it also allows for um, uh, public performances of the work. So we don't have to get a separate license if someone wants to show it at an event, even like a fundraiser or something like that. Um, so so there are ways to, to do this, um, but you really, instead of doing a piecemeal approach where you're like, you know, digitizing all these um, videos, um, you would have, you know, a license and you could use a bunch of, you know, a bunch of videos that were um, in a collection, um, hopefully tailored towards um, the age group that you're looking at. Um, so there, there are a couple issues copyright wise with making, if you made those copies, one is um, the Digital Copyright Millennial Act, which is um, millennium, sorry, not millennial. <laughs> um, it's called the DCMA and that is for breaking technological locks on DVDs and things like that, which would have to usually be done in order to make the copy. And that is, it's illegal to break those locks unless you have an exception. And you wouldn't have an exception for for just you know making the copy for you know making it available to students. And the other thing is you know usually with things like that, um, if you were able to make copies, it would be because um, the original was lost or stolen or um, uh, deteriorating. So sometimes we're able to like you know, preserve old films and stuff like that. But I know that this is not what we're getting at here. So this doesn't fall into what we would allow to, would be allowed to do under preservation and archiving, um, which we do have at the University of Illinois. We have someone who is engaged in preserving old films that are deteriorating and that is allowed, but using, you know, newer DVDs and making copies, um, to stream or to allow students to watch. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to do. Um, but like I said, there are companies like Canopy Hoopla, um, and I'm blanking on the other one, but I'm sure it will come to me when I'm not thinking about it. Um, there are other companies that, that do license for that purpose. And so I would encourage you to look into that um, as a potential um, service provider for streaming videos. All right, well, that's all the questions that came in. Um, thank you, uh, Hannah, for your presentation and Sarah for coming in and helping with the questions. Um, yeah, I it just wanted to have one more reminder that if you have not had enough of copyright and want to learn more, um, Sarah will be back on August 1st to do the Librarian Copyright Superpowers webinar. That's uh, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., August 1st. Um, do either of you have anything you'd like just to say before we wrap up? Um, no, other than feel free to email me if you have specific um, write statements, questions regarding digital collections. Um, but yeah. Well, I hope you I hope you didn't get enough of copyright. I hope everybody here does mm -hmm. come back. It's it's actually a lot of fun. I find copyright really fun. I know I'm pretty nerdy so um, but I try to make it fun for you all um, and the other thing that I would plug right now is that I have a podcast where I try to talk through copyright issues in libraries in particular and it's called copyright chat 
Um, and you can find it if you search on iTunes under my name, Sarah Benson. It's harder to find under its name for some weird reason. But um, I encourage you to listen. It's free. Um, the episodes are usually 20 minutes or less, so they're pretty short. And um, hopefully, uh, maybe you'll start getting excited about copyright like I am. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Sarah. Sarah, we'll see you on the first. And um, to everyone who joined us today, thanks so much for taking some time out and learning more about copyright. And so I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.